Good morning and happy Sabbath, uh, church family. I greet you this morning in the name of Jesus. Today, as I prepare to go into this message, I want to just remember and recall and congratulate Kalia and Chase. Chase and Kalia are the son and daughter of Dr. Shev and Dr. Karen Harris, and they're going to be baptized this afternoon. I also extend congratulations to their grandparents, Brother Lloyd, Elder Lloyd, and Sister Edna Harris. God be with you. This is going to be a wonderful occasion and absolutely makes today a much more blessed Sabbath. The message that I'll bring to you today is entitled, Bringing Out the Best in Me, and it is based in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 28 to 33. As I often do, I would invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It provides an opportunity to stretch our legs and to sharpen our concentration as we go into this message. Quite often as I read scripture, I read from my Bible, the New King James Version, but today because I'm reading from an extract found in the Good News Bible, I'll be doing so from my tablet. Eliab, David's eldest brother, heard David talking to the men. He was angry with David and said, What are you doing here? Who is taking care of those sheep of yours out there in the wilderness, you cheeky brat? You just came to watch the fighting. Now what have I done? asked David. Can't I even ask a question? And every time he asked, he got the same answer. Some men heard what David had said, and they told Saul, who sent for him. David said to Saul, Your Majesty, no one should be afraid of this Philistine. I will go and fight him. No, answered Saul. How could you fight him? You were just a boy, and he has been a soldier all his life. David said to Saul, Your Majesty, no one should be afraid of this Philistine. I will go and fight him. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Lord, speak to me. Speak to us through this message that we may hear and receive the living echoes of your tones. Guide us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're standing, you may be seated. The Philistines mentioned here was Goliath. The Philistine mentioned here was Goliath. Israel was in a national crisis. Goliath's challenge was to send a man to fight him and no one could be found. There's an interesting backstory in how the Bible portrays this military conflict and diplomatic relationship between the two countries. Years earlier, Prince Jonathan, Saul's son and heir apparent, had resoundingly defeated the Philistines during the Battle of Michmash. However, now the nation had become weak because of Saul's disobedience during the Battle of the Amalekites. Spiritual weakness had once again given way to physical weakness as it often does. This is a lesson worthwhile remembering. The diplomatic solution, instead of both armies shedding blood and losing countless lives, was to send a single man into battle. Israel's man would face Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, and the loser would willingly become the slaves of the victor. The nation, once so proudly liberated by the hand of God from Egyptian bondage, faced the real possibility of once again falling into servitude. Uh, disobedience to God's will and direction, brothers and sisters, is a slippery downward slope. The Bible says that Goliath stood six cubits and a span high. He was nine feet nine inches tall. The thought of how tall Goliath was sends a shiver down my spine. Standing six feet tall myself, Goliath was a full three feet taller than I am. Goliath was not an ordinary man. He was a giant. He was an imposing obstacle. 
Goliath was such an imposing figure, dear brothers and sisters, that his name has become universally associated with large insurmountable obstacles that we face. Obstacles which often drive us into crisis, obstacles which are not easily removed when they get in our way, these are referred to as Goliaths. Today I invite us to see the Goliaths which confront us not with human vision, but with vision illuminated by God. Looking at the solution to the crisis that was before him through human eyes, Saul felt that David was just a boy, lacking the experience needed to face the problem. Looking at the same problem by way of, of, of human evaluation, Eliab, the eldest of David's brothers, felt that it was David's overconfidence, his pride, and insolence, as we see in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 28, that was the underlying motive in David's intentions. Eliab assessed that David could not be the response to the problem. David could not be the response that God was offering to the problem because he did not have the welfare of the nation at heart. As we contemplate these thoughts, I want to turn forward through the pages of history and picture a time in scripture when a crisis, a mammoth Goliath, will be faced by all human beings who are alive at the end of time. It is a crisis found in Revelation chapter 6 and is described as the sixth seal or the second to last seal which will be opened before Jesus returns. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 introduces a universal crisis which all persons, all persons, brothers and sisters, living at the end of the age will have to endure. So that we have a marker on what it means when we talk about the end of time, let me explain. You know, unsensitized by years of wars and rumors of wars and global conflicts, People, even those with good intentions at times, have become complacent to the gravity of what it means when we speak of the end of time, when the sixth or second to last seal is open. God describes it plainly to us by stating that during the opening of the sixth seal, an earthquake described in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12 will occur greater in magnitude than any other earthquake that has taken place before in human history. As Seventh-day Adventists, we pay careful attention to these markers and prophetically we believe, brothers and sisters, that the earthquake referred to here was the Lisbon earthquake on November 1st, 1755. Shocks from this earthquake were felt throughout Europe and as far away as Finland and North Africa. According to some sources, it was even felt in Greenland and in the Caribbean over 3,000 kilometers away. Measuring at 8.4 magnitude on the Richter scale, upwards of 30,000 persons were killed in Lisbon, the capital city of Portugal, in a few hours. Here are some of the descriptions of the calamities facing Earth when the sixth seal is opened. Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation 6. Here is how this time is described in the latter, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. The Bible says it will be a time when there will be great earthquakes, when the sun turns black and the moon turns as red as blood. Great will be the calamities affecting the earth, and John the Revelator describes the sky as receding and mountains as beginning to crumble. Kings of the earth, he says, great men, rich men, commanders, mighty men, every slave and every free man will live in fear. In response to the Goliath of a crisis unfolding at this time in earth's history, in helplessness and hopelessness, Persons of every walk of life, kings and slaves, poor men, will seek refuge by running to their traditional strongholds described as mountains, rocks, and caves, and begging them to hide them from the wrath and calamities unfolding 
before their very eyes. Again, this morning at Seventh Day Adventist, based on our best study of the Bible and history, we believe that we are presently in this time and have been so from at least 1755. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, to watch diligently, watch diligently, it says, for we know not the time or the hour when the Son of Man will come. It's not at all surprising by the description of the places where people seek to find shelter, mountains, rocks, and caves, that these both literally and symbolically are the places we turn to, be it our bank accounts, trusted advisors, or peer groups, these are all places that we turn to to seek cover, to restore our faith that things will be all right. But the Bible says at this time in Earth's history, these defenses and these fallbacks that we have traditionally gone to will not provide us with the security we need. Just as Goliath challenged the children of Israel to send a man who could face him, and stand against him in Israel's time of trouble. So also in the distressing vision of the sixth seal found in the book of Revelation, John in vision says to God in chapter 6 and verse 17, Who then is able to stand in the great day of the Lord's wrath? In answer, in answer to this question, in answer to this question, which I will come to in a moment, there are things that we need to look at about the emerging attitudes among people today if we are going to fully understand and appreciate the answer. Time and time again, time and time again, people throughout history have ignored God's love and patience and his warnings. Our attitudes towards his patient has led some to become complicit and even arrogant. Here is how this is expressed in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. There Peter writes several centuries ago, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days. I hope you don't mind me saying when I refer to the last days during the time of the sixth seal. These scoffers will come walking according to their own lusts. This means that we will have our own personal interests at heart. And these scoffers will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, referring to our ancestors, fell asleep, all things continue as they were, from the beginning of creation. Have you ever encountered a person who has said to you, ah, why are you panicking so much? Wars and rumors of wars, they've always been disasters. There's always been hurricanes. You know, especially now in these times that we live by just the press of a button, you can pull up so much information of what has happened disaster-wise in the past. And all of this information has somehow desensitized us to the urgency that Jesus is near, even at the door. These repeated global disasters, instead of waking us up, have lulled us into some false sense that this is just another disaster. And disasters have become like part of some natural cycle. But I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, why God is being so patient. So let's read a little further in 2 Peter chapter 3, this time starting at verse 9. There it says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. In Greek, epangelia, which means good news of salvation, as some count slackness. But God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. God has extended time because of how much he loves us. You know, it's like a teacher. It's like a teacher giving a student additional time 
to understand an assignment and get it right. You know, when we have had such teachers in our lives, don't we love them? And don't we appreciate the care that they invest in us, that extra time and attention they give us to get things right? You know, down through the ages, men have made so many promises and have had so many attempts to fix things, but despite their attempts to fix things and to fix the crisis before us, the Goliaths, the Goliaths of crisis are still all around us. Let me share just a few. On June 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed in France, bringing World War I, which took 20 million lives to a close. It was to bring about a lasting peace. And it was signed by the, and, and, and six months later, the League of Nations signed an agreement on January 10th, 1920. However, by September 1st, 1939, the world was back at war again, this time in an even more deadly conflict than the first time around. Thus, Versailles, which was a treaty that was supposed to bring about peace at man's hands and through his intelligence and strongholds, gave way to World War II in 1939. World War II, which took 85 million lives, came to a close on September 2nd, 1945. To put the deaths in perspective, this would be every living person in Canada dead twice over today. And on October 24th, 1945, the United Nations was formed and on the 10th of February, 1949, the Paris Treaty was signed. The Paris Peace Treaty was signed. But has there been a lasting peace globally? From the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1760 to the high-tech era of the 2020s, technology and the study of microbiology to ease our lives and to make things better, to solve our Goliaths, have not entirely solved our problems. Despite volumes and volumes of behavioral science studies, we have not solved the problem of fear and insecurity and loneliness. Despite the invention of the microscope in 1590 by Zacharias Jensen and the first wonder drug antibiotic penicillin invented and developed by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928, here we are today, still in the midst of a global pandemic caused by a virus called COVID-19. Certainly knowledge, with all of its great benefits to mankind, has solved many of our problems, but it has not solved all of your problems. Truly the question is, who is able to stand if you have not encountered a Goliath? If you have not encountered a Goliath as yet, you will someday. These strongholds, man's inventions, diplomacy, industrial progress, medical technology have proven time and time again to be able to deliver, but only deliver so much because they have not defeated all of the Goliaths we face. The simplest, brothers and sisters, undeniable truth that man has not been able to solve our problems in spite of all of our advancements is that we still have no solution today to solve the greatest problem that man faces and that is the problem of death. Only the Bible and an intelligent loving God offers an answer to this ultimate of all Goliaths and crises we face. If all the arguments put forward by scientists, philosophers, humanists, none of them even venture they say I have found a solution to death. The iPhone 2 was the solution to the glitches in the iPhone 1. The cell phone was the solution improvement to the restrictions of the home phone. But what in the world of human inventions and teachings is the solution to death? Remarkably, there are none except the solution provided by a loving and intelligent God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, concerning God's love and desire is that none should perish. How then shall we face that great day? With this, I turn my attention back to David and the story of David and Goliath. 
we can stand as David did by allowing the crisis, by allowing the crisis that he faced to bring out the best in him. Taking him into an ever deepening relationship with God, with God, molding him and shaping him into one who could stand as we read in, as we read in Revelation 7 and verse 3. There it describes those who are able to stand in the face of crisis as those who are the sealed servants of the living God. David's life goal, goal was to allow God to have his own way in leading him forward even when he sinned. David, I dare say, was sealed as we all strive to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 it says, In him, referring to God, you also trusted after you heard the words of truth. This word was the good word of the news of your salvation, in whom also you have believed. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. This praise of glory and redemption is everlasting life with God. So, in a time of crisis, David could oppose Eliab, his brother, because his intentions were for the greater good and not selfish as Eliab accused. Working for the greater good always brings out our best. Despite Saul's lack of confidence and his offer of armor, another one of man's strongholds, David would face the battle armored by God. In Psalms 121, David says this, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Look into the hills, prompted the meditation. The hills were not David's helper. Read it for yourself. His answer was, my help comes from the Lord who made the hills. In Psalms 46, he says, the Lord is my refuge and my strength. Who shall I fear even in times of crisis? In response to the threatening words of Goliath, David could say to Goliath, You come to me with man's strongholds, swords, spears, and javelins, but I come to you in crisis. I come to you when my nation is in crisis in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied because of his reliance on God in crisis. God brought out the best in David. Are you today? allowing moments of crisis to bring out the best in you. In the moment of crisis, David put God's people first, and they knew it. Thus the women could rejoice in his victories, and some of his ten thousands in battles. Battles fought for the welfare of the nation and for the glory of God. In the crisis of being hunted like an animal by Saul, David's relationship with Jonathan was deepened. Read what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 42. May the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. God placed a strong bond between David and Jonathan during times of crisis. Is this time of crisis in COVID-19 deepening your relationships in crisis? David sought to rebuild weakened relationships in response to Saul's violence against him. He campaigned, he campaigned for, for, for Saul's life and declared, Touch not the Lord's anointed and do not his prophet any harm. Even though Saul hunted David at the news of Saul's death, David tore his clothes and David went down into mourning and fasted because Saul had died. In later life, as king and ruler of Israel, in reflection of all the crisis through which God had enabled him to stand, humility would take him back to his roots as he reminisced through the picture and the narrative of his previous life, lived as a humble shepherd, testifying of God's goodness. He wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. It was a God who had brought him through every crisis that he had faced in life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through crises, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in crisis, in the presence of my Goliaths. 
my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. In the midst of crisis, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, including eternal life, when God defeats the greatest crisis that we face, which is death. How do I know? Because the psalmist says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Revelation chapter 7 describes a multitude of individuals who have passed through the pestilences of the sixth seal and who were able to stand. In chapter 7 and verse 14, the question is asked, And who in this great multitude, arrayed in robes made white by the blood of the Lamb, a multitude so great that no man could number, who was this multitude? The answer that comes to John is these are those who have passed through great tribulation, through great crises, and have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Imagine that! Red blood making robes white. Thus the robes are our lives purified by the blood of Christ. They are before God serving Him day and night in His temple. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And he who sits on the throne dwells with them. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There shall neither hunger or thirst no more. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For the Lamb of God is he who sits on the throne and he shepherds them and leads them to fountains of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye, every tear that has been caused by crises. For I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For students going back to school shortly after this historical, unprecedented time in which we have lived because of COVID-19, is this crisis bringing out the best person in you? For business people, how does a situation like COVID-19 make you more honest, more trustworthy? I'm more appreciative of the trust and responsibilities God has vested in you. For teachers and professors, how will the last few months shape your approach and commitment to student education as you return to the classroom? For ministry leaders, how has this crisis sharpened your call? And how has this crisis of COVID-19 refocus that you are serving in a God-ordained ministry, answering God's appointed call in a way that will give him glory. For seniors, living nearer to the end of your days than the beginning moments of your lives, how does this period shape the passing on of your legacy and, your inv and the investment of yourself and your knowledge in a young upcoming person through intergenerational connections before you lay down your life's labors. Young people, how is this period shaping your desire to know and learn from the wealth of experience which has sat by you week by week in the pews? Have you even taken time to call that adult that senior who week after week has encouraged you with words of compliment or even at times words of correction. Has COVID-19 brought out the best in us? Or have we become like the scoffers? For since the fathers, time continues as it always has. I'll finish with one final thought from Peter's epistle, encouraging you to let COVID-19 bring out the very best in you. Just as crisis brought out the best in persons like Ellen G. White, who lost two children while serving in ministry, and Joseph Bates, a founder of the Adventist Church, who ended his life far poorer than when he began because he invested all of his money in the building up of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And John Andrews, after whom Andrews University is named, who left the comforts of the U.S. to go to Switzerland and spread the message there, enduring many hardships back at home in his family in 
the Eastern United States? Or what about persons like W.W. W. Schaefer, who were among the formidable black preachers building up the Adventist work in the North and Southern parts of the United States, despite living every day as a second class citizen because they were black giants of the Adventist faith. These men and women allowed crises to shape them for the better. Youth, adults, seniors, children of God at Benjamin Church, are we allowing this time of COVID-19 to bring out the very, very best in who we are? Are we allowing God to have his own way in our lives through this time of crisis? Can you truly look yourself in the mirror and say that this time of crisis is truly a refining time in my walk with God. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, my part in scripture, read from the New Living Translation, says this, These trials will show that our faith is genuine. Our faith is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though our faith is far more precious than gold, so when our faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Brothers and sisters, as we live in this global pandemic, a historical event, one like no other event that we have experienced. It is my earnest desire today that this crisis will bring out the best in us, will shape us for the soon coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Will you take some time to pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to give of our best to the master. We've been living through this global pandemic now since March. And for every intent and purpose from all that we read and say, it does appear that life will have to go on and that we may be living through this time for yet till the end of this year, maybe even into next year, according to some reports that we have heard. So, Father, help us not to miss out on what you are speaking into our lives during this time. Father, just as David faced challenges and it brought out the best in his life, we pray, O oh God, that we would be refined as gold in the fire and would come out all the better as a result of this. May your hand continue to guide us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And Father, as we add two new members to our church today, through the watery grave of baptism, we lift them up before you. We lift up Chase and Kalia before you. Father God, we pray that your hand would be upon them, shaping their development through every phase of life, be it good or bad. And Father, may they, along with us, be able to say, at the end of time, to God be the glory, great things he have done even during times of crisis in our lives. So bless us now, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Benjamin Church family. May God richly bless you.